This talk is part of an online commutative algebra course and will be about Hensel's lemma. So, um, Hensel's lemma is about how to find solutions of equations over completions of rings. So, we remember last lecture we defined the completion of a ring with respect to an ideal i to be the inverse limit of all the quotients r over i to the n. So, a fairly typical example is the p-adic numbers, which is the inverse limit of z modulo p to the n z. Um, now, a common problem is to try and find roots of equations. So let's look at the following two problems. Let's try and find a... Um, does x cubed minus 5x minus 2 equals naught have a root in the rationals? And the second question is, does x cubed minus 5x minus 2 equals naught have a root in the reals? Now the second question, the answer is incredibly obvious because it's positive, this is positive for large positive x and negative for negative x and so by the intermediate value theorem this must have a root somewhere in the reals. Um, this one on the other hand you probably have to think about a bit to figure out whether it has a root or not. So the point is it's sometimes much easier to show that polynomials have roots over the reals than to show they have roots over the rationals. Um, and part of the reason for this is that the real numbers form a complete field. Um, now the completions of rings are also complete in some sense and they have a sort of analogue of this property that it is sometimes easy to show that they have roots. So Hensel's lemma says roughly um, says that if we can solve an equation modulo i to the n for suitable n, we can solve it in the completion of a ring. Um, so, obvious question is, um, um, what exactly is this number n? Well, number n sort of depends on which equation we're trying to solve, as we will see <coughs> in a moment. So for the real numbers, um, the existence of roots tends to follow from the intermediate value theorem. So Hensel's lemma is a sort of analogue for p-adic numbers of the intermediate value theorem. It, it, it makes it easier to show that equations have roots. Anyway, we're now going to look at Hensel's lemma a bit more precisely. So here's the first version. So version one. Suppose um, I is an ideal of a ring R with completion R hat. And suppose you've got a polynomial with coefficients in R hat. And suppose you've got a root a in r modulo i. So, so this means that f of a is congruent to 0 mod i. Then a can be lifted to a root in r hat provided um, um, the derivative of f at a is invertible in um, r modulo i. So in applications r modulo i will often be um, a field because i might be maximal so this says, just says that f prime of a is not equal to zero in r over i here where i is maximal. So in this particular case it says roughly that A is a simple root of um, F, um, not a double root or, or a root of higher order. We'll see in a little bit later what happens if A is a double root. Um, well, this is quite easy to prove. It's enough to show that any root in 
r over i to the n can be lifted to a root in r over i to the n plus 1, because then we can stop with our root in r over i, and then we get roots in r over i squared, r over i cubed, and so on. And we join these all together and get a root in the completion. So here we're just sort of doing it one step at a time. So suppose we've got a root modulo i to the n. So if f a is an i to the n, so a is a root modulo i to the n. And now we want to lift a to a root modulo i to the n plus 1. So let's try and find a root f of a plus epsilon um, that is in i to the n plus 1. So we want to find some epsilon with this property. So we're starting with our root modulo i to the n, and we're just trying to perturb it a little bit to make it a root modulo i to the n plus 1. So how do we do this? Well, we can expand this as it's f of a plus epsilon f prime of a, and so on. So this suggests we should try epsilon is minus f of a over f prime of a. Well, um, we have a little bit of a problem, you know. We, we want to know what does this mean, because f prime of a, well, it's not really a unit in not necessarily a unit in R or anything like that. Well, um, what we know is that f prime of a is a unit in R modulo i. So, so f prime of a times f prime of a to the minus 1 is equal to 1 in R over i for some f prime of a to the minus 1. So this is really in R modulo i rather than in R, but we can sort of pretend it's in R. But now we can just define um, 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 we, we, we just we can then see that f of a plus epsilon with this um, this value of epsilon is is still going to be well defined modulo um, i to the n plus one because this is the inverse here is defined modulo i, and this is an element of i to the n. So we find that f a plus i is um, um, a multiple of, it's something in i times f of i, which is in i to the n plus 1. Um, so that, sorry, that's a subset of i to the n plus 1. So um, whenever we've got a root modulo i to the n, we can just lift it to a root modulo i to the n plus 1 by doing this construction. So let's see an example of this. Well, let's just take the square root of 7 in z modulo 3. So this is the completion of the integers at the ideal of all multiples of 3. So this is the usual ring of 3 adic integers. Well, here the polynomial f of x is equal to x squared minus 7, and we want to solve f of x equals 0. And we look at f prime of x. Well, this is just 2x. Um, now, it has a solution a equals 1 in z modulo 3z. And we notice that f prime of a is equal to 2 which is not congruent to 0 in z modulo 3z, so the condition is satisfied. So the root a mod 3 lifts to a root in z mod in um, the threadic numbers. And it's quite easy to work it out. You remember this, this proof we sort of um, find Roughly speaking, we find the digits of a one at a time. For, um, each time we find n digits, we can do this construction and find n plus one digits. And if you do this, we find the lift is, you know, the first few digits are two zero one one one. In case you're wondering, this is this is in base three. So, so if if we look at that, the root is going to be four modulo three squared, and here it's going to be. 9 plus 3 plus 1, which is 13 modulo 3 cubed, and so on. Um, and we can 
do something similar uh, for finding square roots in ZP for P odd. So what about um, the ring of units in ZP star? Here I'm going to take P odd for a reason that will appear very shortly. And we want to know what are the squares. Well, there are two obvious properties a square has. First of all, the number of zeros at the end of the p-adic expansion is even. In other words, if we've got a number 2317000 as its p-adic expansion, the number of zeros at the end must obviously be even because if you square something, the number of zeros at the end is going to be even. So um, we may as well remove an even number of zeros, and we're left with the problem of numbers whose last digit is odd. So um, um, obviously the first non-zero digit is a square mod p. So if we were looking at this mod p, we'd have to have 7 is a square modulo p. So uh, conversely, if these two conditions are satisfied, then Hensel's lemma implies that the number is a square. And we may as well assume the number of digits at the end is 0, and then all we're trying to do is to solve x squared is congruent to b modulo p, where b is a square. Well, we can, we can solve this by assumption mod p because b is a square, and the derivative is 2x, which is non-zero mod p. Um, and the reason it's non-zero mod p is because 2 is not equal to p. If, if, if p was 2, then this condition would break down. So this gives us the structure of the group of units in the p-adic numbers modulo the squares, and it's just z over 2z times z over 2z, where this first z over 2z comes from the fact the number of digits at the end, number of zeros at the end is even, and the second z over 2z is the other obstruction coming from the fact that the last non-zero digit or first non-zero digit or whatever, must be a square. Well, um, we've had to use the fact that p is odd. So obviously we should ask what happens if p is even. So we can ask what about p equals 2. Um, so let's try and solve x squared minus a equals naught in the two adic integers. Um, well, the problem, a root modulo 2 to the n cannot always be lifted um, to a root modulo 2 to the n plus 1. And we can see this easily because we have 1 squared is congruent to 5 modulo 2 squared, but a squared is congruent to 5 modulo 2 cubed. There's no solutions. So there's no way to lift this solution modulo 2 squared to a solution modulo 2 cubed, and um, our previous argument breaks down. And it, it breaks down because if, if f of x is this thing here, then f prime of x is just 2x, and we saw earlier that this is no longer a unit, and our entire argument breaks down. Um, so um, we need to find a refinement of Hensel's lemma that will work for this case and tell us what the squares in the two-adic numbers are. So, um, um, Suppose that um, here I'm going to work in the ring ZP of p-adic numbers, 
Um, there are versions of this for other completions, but it'll just simplify notation a bit if I fix this example. So suppose f of a is congruent to 0 mod p to the 2d plus 1 for some number d. Um, and suppose that f prime of a is not congruent to 0 mod p to the d plus 1. Then a can be lifted to a root in zp. So you notice that uh, if d equals naught, this is just the previous case. It, then we would just say that f is a 0 mod p and its derivative is not 0 mod p. Um, so you can prove this in the same way as um, the case d equals 0, but I'm going to give a slightly different proof. Well, it's actually really almost the same proof, but whatever. Um, what we're going to do is to use Newton's method for finding roots. So you remember Newton's method for finding a root of a polynomial over the reals works like this. What we do is we start with an approximate root x0, and then what we do is we draw the tangent line here and find a new root x1. And then we keep doing that. We draw the tangent line and get x2 and so on. And um, if you do a little bit of algebra, you find that xn plus 1 is equal to xn minus f of xn over f prime of xn. So we can try and find a root of a polynomial over the reals by starting with an approximate value of the root and iterating this. And if you remember from numerical analysis, Newton's method sometimes behaves really well and sometimes behaves dreadfully. I mean, it sometimes goes into wild oscillations if you don't start sufficiently close to a root or if the root is a double root or something. Anyway, it turns out that for p-adic numbers, Newton's method behaves much better. Um, so let's just have a look at Newton's method over the p-adic numbers. So we write f of xn plus 1 is equal to f of xn plus, um, minus f prime of xn times f of xn over f prime of xn plus f double prime of xn over 2 factorial times f of xn over f prime of xn squared and so on. So this is this is just the um, usual Taylor series expansion of um, f of xn plus 1, which is just f of xn plus, so minus f of xn over f prime of xn. Um, now, you notice immediately that the first two terms cancel out. And the third term is pretty small. So um, remember, f of xn is divisible by p to the 2d plus 1 times something. And f prime of xn is divisible by, at most, p to the d. So. Um, this stuff here is all divisible by p to the 2d plus 2. And there are further terms here which I haven't bothered to write out, but they're divisible by even higher powers of p, so you don't need to worry about them. And you might be feeling a little bit nervous about this 2 factorial because um, you, you seem to be dividing by something, but we notice that f double prime xn over 2 factorial has coefficients in um, zp. Um, you notice that um, if you take the second derivative of x to the n and divide it by 2 factorial, this is just equal to n n minus 1 over 2 times x to the n minus 2. And this thing here is actually an integer. So these denominators don't really cause problems. Anyway, what we see from this is that 
if fxn is congruent to 0 mod p to the d plus 1, then, um, sorry, 2d plus 1, then you iterate Newton's method once and it's now divisible by p to the 2d plus 2. In fact, more generally, we see that if f of xn is divisible by um, p to the 2d plus k, this implies f of x to the n plus 1 is 0 mod p to the 2d plus 2k. So in fact, it's really great because we're nearly doubling the number of correct digits we have each step. Um, you remember a similar thing happens for the real numbers when Newton's method is working really well. The, the number of correct decimal digits doubles um, at each step of Newton's method. So the same thing works periodically, except it's much easier to prove. Um, so um, using this, we can now answer the question, when does b in z2 have a square root? Um, so first of all, it must have an even number of zeros at the end. And if it's got an even number of zeros at the end, we can just cancel these out and assume the last digit is 1. Well, um, so, so suppose the last digit is 1, then it has a square root if and only if it's congruent to 1 modulo 2 cubed rather than 2. And um, you can see this because we're trying to solve x squared minus b equals 0. So we need f prime of x, which is 2x, so this is fx, should not be 0 modulo 2 to the d plus 1. Um, well, so we can take d equals 1, because this will be 2 times something odd, which is not 0 modulo 2 squared. So um, a root exists if um, um, x squared minus b equals 0 has a root modulo 2 to the 2d plus 1, which is 2 cubed. So, so an odd integer has a root in the two addict numbers, if and only if it's congruent to 1 modulo 8. Um, from this, you can easily check that if you take the um, two addict units modulo the squares of the two addict units, then this is z modulo 2, z times z modulo 2, z, rather than being just z modulo 2, z. You remember z p star modulo z p star squared was just z modulo 2, z. Um, if you don't insist that this number should be a unit, then um, um, you, you get z modulo 2z times z modulo 2z times z modulo 2z, because you could also have some zeros at the end. Um, I'll just finish off by giving a slightly more complicated example. Let's try and find out which numbers are fourth roots in z, um, in, um, in the two addict numbers. Um, so we're trying to solve um, x to the 4 minus b equals 0, and let's assume b is odd, because if it isn't, you can just take out a number of factors of 2, and if the number of factors of 2 you take out isn't divisible by 4, then it's not a fourth power. So um, here's our polynomial f of x, and we know f prime of x is equal to 4x cubed. And now we want f prime of x should not be 0 modulo um, 2 to the d plus 1. Um, well, it's going to be 4 times something odd, so we can take d equals 2. So the fourth root exists if um, f of x 
equals x to the 4 minus b equals 0 has a root modulo 2 to the 2d plus 1, which is 2 to the 5. So uh, a two-adic integer, an odd two-adic integer, has a root, provided it's got a root modulo 2 to the 5. So, so let's just check when this happens. We need to find the, the fourth powers in z modulo 2 to the 5z. Well, they turn out to be 1 and 17, as you can easily check. And in fact, you notice that um, these are just the numbers that are 1 modulo 2 to the 4. So um, b has a fourth root if b is congruent to 1 modulo 2 to the 4. So but by sort of accident, we can just reduce from 2 to the 5 to 2 to the 4 in this case. OK, that's enough about using Hensel's lemma to find roots of a polynomial. Uh, next lecture will be about using um, Hensel's lemma in a slightly more complicated way to factorise a polynomial into possibly non-linear factors.